Welcome, Dr. Uh, Rani Al Mashat, uh, Your Excellency, the Minister of uh, Tourism uh, for the Republic of Egypt. Welcome to Talks at Google. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rania is, uh, is the youngest uh, minister uh, in Egypt ever, and uh, she is responsible for uh, tourism, a very vibrant uh, sector in, in Egypt. Uh, of course, uh, she has had a trailblaze uh, of a career, uh, PhD at 25 years uh, old from uh, University of uh, Maryland in, uh, uh, in the US and uh, worked at the IMF, International Monetary Fund, and, uh, and returned to, to, uh, to Egypt to help uh, with the economy. Uh, as, uh, um, as a sub-governor of the Central Bank of Egypt, very important uh, jobs. And then we turn back to the IMF. Uh, uh, on, on this uh, trail, she, she was uh, named the most, uh, out of the 50 top most influential women in the Egyptian uh, economy, and uh, is also a, a young global leader. Uh, and was appointed Minister of Tourism uh, in January 2018, right? So welcome, uh, Dr. Rania. Thank you very much, Slim, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, taking the time to come and uh, listen to me. Um, it's very uh, honorable to be here at uh, Google. Uh, of course, all of us uh, uh, use your search engines uh, <laughs> more than one time a day. <laughs> And um, uh, it's wonderful to, uh, to be in a hub uh, that promotes uh, innovation, that promotes uh, uh, ways or finds tools to uh, actually uh, cope with the fourth industrial revolution. Thank you for making the time. I know you have a very busy schedule and really we, we want to take this opportunity to know more about uh, Dr. Rania, your personal journey. Uh, you've had an acceleration uh, 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 an accelerated uh, career and uh, the question is uh, where is it uh, at what time really you felt that there was a turning point there was uh, this inflection point I would say okay well uh, first um, uh, uh, I'm Rania uh, Al Mashat I uh, I'm uh, the eldest uh, uh, daughter in, mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a family where I have two siblings uh, two younger brothers and um, uh, a very proud Egyptian, uh, someone who does not uh, really see uh, gender differences. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was part of the uh, upbringing. Um, We'd like to talk about that. Yes, yes. And um, uh, my journey is one that, uh, that uh, is, uh, started when I was seven years old. Mm -hmm. I come from a family where my uh, father uh, is uh, a political scientist. And um, growing up, uh, the house was full of politicians and public figures at a very young age. So I would see all my father's friends uh, at home having dinner. And then the following day, uh, they would either be on the radio or uh, in the newspaper or on TV. So I was seven years old and, you know, so I see them at home having fun and having dessert and salad and stuff and discussions. And then the next day, <laughs> they're all over the news and stuff. And, and the only thing that was common between all these people was that they all had PhDs. Okay. So at the age of seven, they would ask me, what do you want when you grow up? Or what do you want to be? And I said, doctora. <laughs> <laughs> In what PhD. field? Isn't that just, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the concept that uh, through education, uh, you are able to have influence through uh, uh, being good at a subject matter, you are able to uh, be credible. Mm -hmm. I think the, this was really what uh, shaped uh, uh, my interest from a very young age. So really, at the age of seven, they would ask me, what do you want growing up? And I would say a PhD, because I want to be influential. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, rightly so, growing up, I was always good at school. Um, came college time, uh, I went to the American University in Cairo. Yes. There's a funny story around that, but I don't know how much time we have. Uh, because when you ask yeah, about time. the, inf we have time, okay, <laughs> we, you, you ask about the inflection points, there always, are so many. Always time for funny stories. Yeah, there, there is my life, uh, even though it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, good positions, uh, successful posts, but uh, there are anecdotes 
uh, which uh, leave me believing, and this I always say, uh, we are a mass of energy. Mm -hmm. And so uh, whatever you think of, yeah. you can really achieve. And uh, the universe conspires for you, okay. not against you. All right. And um, uh, when I was, uh, when I was uh, around, uh, uh, I was here actually in the UAE around mm -hmm. high school time. Uh, I was actually in Alain. Alain. Uh, my father was teaching at Alain University. All right. um, Dubai was very nascent at the time, and there was only the Gurir Center and so forth. But uh, um, I did uh, a foreign certificate uh -huh. in, uh, in Alain. And in Egypt at the time, you can actually skip two years of high school and go to college if you had a foreign certificate. So I finished 10th uh, grade and uh, was applying to go to university in Egypt. You know, you're going from high school to university, you're buying clothes, you're, you're so excited, you're going to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, able to drive maybe to go to college, you mm. have classes, it's not a classroom like in, in, in high school. And then, two weeks before college starts, the Minister of Education, with one signature, takes out a decree that says you have to have three years of high school. Oh, yeah. So like my whole uh, uh, concept and dream of going to university uh, just got shattered. And, uh, but then, uh, and that's when I tell you the, uni the universe conspires for you, uh, we came back to UAE. Uh, I was very upset. Half of my health, uh, hair fell off, very, very depressed. So my mom told my dad, uh, Man, I'm, you have to go and help Rania. Go to, to Egypt and find something. He's like, go do what? So I, she said, I don't know. She's upset, you have to do something. So my poor dad <laughs> leaves UAE, goes on a trip to uh, Cairo, asks in schools, raises, uh, files a, a lawsuit with other parents because they cannot do this like you know, two weeks before school starts or university starts. And then he met one of his old friends and he told him, Menaim, why are you so upset? Just go to the AUC. Mm -hmm. They have a system which is different than the than, uh, than uh, American University uh, of Cairo. Yeah, American University. It's a system other than the government universities. Mm -hmm. So my dad went, and they told him, yes, of course, she can apply. But the thing is, tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., she has to be in Eworth Hall to do her aptitude test and English test. Mm -hmm. And I was in oh, UAE. Yeah. Yes. So my dad calls. Can you get on a flight tonight to be at AUC 8 a.m.? Because this is like a test for all applicants. So I rightly do take a flight. And there's another funny story about it. On the way from Alain to Dubai to take the flight, Air France, uh, the, uh, the tire of the car oh bur you know, bursts oh my with my two of my <laughs> father's friends. And we had to take a taxi anyway. And they called my name. I, was, I, was, I just made it on the flight. I arrive in Cairo, uh, 6.30 AM on that Air France flight. And uh, I go take the English test and the aptitude test. And rightly so, I get into university uh, at the American University in Cairo. Okay. This was in 1991. And uh, at that time, in 1991, since we're here you know, talking about digitalization and Google and all that, computers were very new. At that yes. time, there was a floppy disk, yes. the <laughs> five and a half floppy disk. And uh, in 1991, every parent wanted their kids to be a computer scientist. Right. And AUC at the time uh, did not have uh, uh, engineering for hardware, but there was programming mm -hmm. software. So my parents kept on telling me, you have to be a computer scientist. You have to be a co go into computers. <laughs> so anyway, I do my advising. I take 106. I, I, you know, I declare computer. I spend two years as a computer science major, of course, acing all my classes, having the highest GPA. But sitting with myself, I would say I would never do anything related to computer unless I had an assignment from a professor. So okay. if I graduate, how am I supposed to show my true self? How am I supposed to show my skills if it's only fulfilling an assignment? Mm -hmm. So anyway, I told my professors, I'm leaving computer science. Of course, everyone was shedding a tear. How come? You're the number one, da 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 da. Then my parents were like, go to business administration. That's the highest <laughs> second GP <laughs> in. In, in the school. So I declared business administration for one semester, which I also hated mm -hmm. because it was all about, you know, 14 multiple choice questions. Yes. And, you know, I always ace that as well. So and then my, um, 
my late father's uh, friend, uh, very close to us, he told me, Rania, economics mm -hmm. is a science. It's a discipline that, that has a history. Why don't you declare economics? So mm. at AUC, I spent two years computer science major, one semester business administration major, mm. and then one and a half year as an economics major. All right. Uh, I graduated from AUC in June 1995. I was on a plane to the US on July 4th, 1995. Another funny story. Uh, so entering, entering university, I told yes. you the story. Now, during my graduating senior year, mm -hmm. um, I told my mom and dad one day, I'm going to go and do my GRA, GRE tests. Mm -hmm. So they said, why? I said, because I'm going to graduate and I'm going to go and do my PhD. <laughs> and they said, um, my mom looked at me and said, but, you know, I don't want you to travel and do your PhD. You work here a little bit, you get married, and then you go and do your PhD. <laughs> 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 so then I went to my father and told him, I want to travel, I want to go and do my GRE because I want to travel and do my PhD. And he said, well, did you ask your mom? I'm like, guys, I told you this since I was seven. <laughs> I was very clear with what I wanted. So anyway, I got refused from both parents, no yeah. traveling. So then I applied uh, to different, of course, jobs. At that time, uh, in Cairo, in Cairo yeah. uh, the best job for any AUC graduate was P&G. That was the number one job because it was only multinational. Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble. Yeah. So I, I got you know, an offer from Procter & Gamble. I got an offer to, uh, at the Social Research Center at the American University. I got a scholarship to do my master's at American University. It's called the Sasakawa Scholarship. And then in December of 1994, my father was asked by the Egyptian government to be the cultural attache for Egypt in Washington, DC. All right. So he traveled to the United yeah. States in January 1995. He came, attended my graduation in June 1995, and then the whole family was on a plane to the U.S. in July 1995, and I started my PhD in August. So that's the universe conspiring. That's the universe conspiring for you. For you. So you set your goals. Wonderful. You believe in what you want. You close your eyes, and you see that dream. Yeah. And trust me, it will happen. That's amazing. So you discovered economics uh, late, a little bit late in your university degrees, and then you went on to become, to have a PhD, a doctor in, in economics. Yes. In, in Maryland University, which is, which is one of the most famous uh, universities for economics, right? Yes. Um, and um, economics is, uh, is and, and what, what, what was so fascinating and, and why I wanted to do a PhD in economics is, um, at that time, economic development mm -hmm. and international trade were very, very big. This was at the beginning of the GATS and mm -hmm. the, and the uh, WTO and uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, countries signing on trade agreements and free trade zones and all that sort of stuff. And the idea of um, country taking policies mm -hmm. to uh, better the lives of its citizens, openness, trade, flow of... Uh, <laughs> Uh, flow of products. Um, um, these were all very fascinating topics. Yeah. So this idea yeah. of uh, a Laffer curve and what is the how do you how do you how do people uh, become better off and what should government do? All of these were very, uh, very uh, uh, in inspiring concepts uh, to me. Mm -hmm. So uh, after I finished after I finished that one year and a half as an undergraduate, I said, okay, the PhD that I want yes. is a PhD in economics. Fantastic. So uh, you, you sort of uh, experimented and uh, didn't work. Yes. You changed quickly. Something that we promote a lot uh, <laughs> in entrepreneurship. You know, if you want to yes. change, change quickly. Yes. Or if you want to fail, fail quickly and then move on. And then you went on because you were hired by I the IMF. You had a trailblazing uh, yes. career. And then, uh, and then all of a sudden somebody said, you know, the home country calls you back. Right? Yes. And uh, you were extremely successful at the IMF because you, you went around the world advising uh, countries in, uh, in Africa and Asia. Uh, I actually read Daughters of the Nile, the chapter that you wrote. I advise everyone to, to read it. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, when they called you back home, um, everybody was worried, right? Yes. Uh, and I, I recall this from the article that uh, you're too young. 
and you're, you're a woman, what are you going to go back and do there, right, yeah. uh, in, 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 a, in a way? And uh, can you expand a little bit on this and talk about, uh, uh, maybe share with the audience the four C's that uh, <laughs> Yes, that the you um, just some, something about uh, the U.S. and education and IMF. Uh, to me, um, uh, education was always the means mm -hmm. to come back and serve my country at some point. Uh, the IMF was also, uh, uh, I did w while I was doing my PhD, I did two internships, mm -hmm. uh, one at the IMF and one at the World Bank. Mm -hmm. And even though they're just uh, like uh, across each other uh, in Washington, D.C., the two institutions are very different. One looks at financial stability yes. in the world, one looks at more um, um, different projects and developmental projects. And um, uh, after doing that internship at the IMF, I said the only thing that would keep me in the U.S. would be if I get a job at the IMF. To me, it was uh, a place where you learn how to uh, create comprehensive policy frameworks, how you uh, sit down with authorities in countries, whether it's finance, central bank, uh, trade and industry, different different ministers and you have to sit, convince them with certain ways, negotiate uh, and explain how you uh, uh, better the lives of people. So to me it was a very important um, institution mm -hmm. that would again serve uh, an end in my head, but I didn't know when that end would come. I mean, how mm -hmm. I would go back, in what form. Um, and then in, uh, in, 2000 and in, in October of 2004, um, uh, I was approached by, uh, by uh, at the time, the Minister of Investment in Egypt, and he said, Rania, you know, why don't you uh, uh, come back uh, to the central bank? And I said, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I, uh, when I was doing my PhD in Maryland, uh, most of my friends from Latin America, they would either go back to the Ministry of Finance or to the central bank. Mm -hmm. But in Egypt, the system didn't allow. Mm -hmm. You had to be a but to be a, s uh, a public servant, you had to uh, start to from start from from right after graduation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so for the first time uh, in Egypt's uh, uh, government history, uh, in 2004, 2005, uh, people from abroad or from outside the system were allowed to take uh, key positions. So. Um, um, I, I was uh, very excited. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was given uh, a sub-governor for monetary policy. My mm -hmm. PhD is on monetary policy and, and uh, 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 public debt management. Yeah. And um, my friends, as you mentioned, at the IMF were very worried. They're like, Rania, we're worried. You're going back. You're a woman, this and that. And I said, this concept of woman is something that I don't think about too much. Maybe seniority is more important, given mm -hmm. our, our, our history. And then comes uh, the four C's that you mentioned. Yes. Uh, and and these, are, these are principles uh, of success that I believe in very much. And uh, they are uh, in this order. Mm -hmm. Competence, connections, mm -hmm. confidence, and charm. All right. And let me elaborate a little bit. <laughs> uh, you have to be competent in anything you do. Right. And uh, you gain that competence from being passionate. So when I take look back and I say, okay, I was going to be a computer scientist, I'll probably get a very high GPA, graduate with honors, and then be employed. But I probably would, I did not have that passion yes. to sit down and program. So you have to be competent in what you do. And competence comes by every day you're learning something new and you're adding to that discipline and you're, crea you're becoming a su an expert in a subject matter. So that's number one. Number two, connections are extremely important. Extremely important. You can be competent, but without connections, you may not get to different places. You may not have uh, networks. You may not have exposure. Uh, you, you may not be referred mm -hmm. uh, uh, to go and speak at the conference or go on, uh, and, and be nominated for something. And just to have connections without competence will never work also. It's, no, it's not going to be a sustained uh, path right. whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the third is to have confidence. Mm -hmm. And there's a very uh, thin line between confidence and arrogance. Yes. You're only confident if you're competent in what you are doing. But if you're not competent, your confidence becomes arrogance. And, people, and that's very easy to, uh, uh, to be discovered. So, so, and that's why the order matters. And then the last thing is to be charming. And uh, charm is, uh, is to have this intuition on how to deal with people in different uh, 
circumstances. So for example, uh, when I was sub-governor in the central bank, I was the youngest sub-governor, and uh, I had uh, subordinates who were double my age. Mm -hmm. So there were at moments you had to be extremely firm, yes. and there mm -hmm. are moments where you have to crack a joke. Uh, when you're in a meeting room and you're the youngest, uh, uh, most competent female with many senior people, uh, and, you, and, and the, you, you have to grab their attention, they have to listen to you, and uh, there's, just a, there's just a way, a demeanor of how you present your ideas, uh, how you become very firm at certain points, yeah. how you, you become more malleable and more flexible. Mm -hmm. So this is the, this is the charm is, uh, is, uh, uh, is, is how, uh, how I would describe it, is how you deal with, with certain yeah. circumstances. So these are my four C's, and that's what I told my friends at the IMF. Uh, these are my principles that I believe in, and I'll be applying them uh, when I'm back home. So this is a secret sauce, right? Yeah, so that these are the <laughs> yeah, secret seasons. formula that, uh, that help you accelerate. And then, uh, and, then, uh, and then after that, you, you actually were uh, entrusted with the um, Ministry of Tourism in uh, 2018, right? You, you had a lot of things in between. Yes. But we're really eager to hear about tourism yeah. and Egypt uh, uh, and uh, so it's very counterintuitive uh, when you think about it. Um, I was a uh, 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 PhD in economics, spent five years at the IMF, spent mm. 11 years at the Central Bank of Egypt, yes. uh, seen different phases of the Egyptian economy, uh, uh, the revolution, after the revolution, and then I went back as uh, advisor to the IMF's chief economist. Uh, I went back to the IMF in, uh, in, in August 2016. Mm -hmm. And then in January 2018, uh, while I'm on mission in Jordan uh, for monetary policy and financial stability, uh, and this is also another funny story. Mm -hmm. um, so I, before going to Jordan, uh, which was uh, on January uh, 9th, I, was, uh, I spent New Year's in Siwa. And since I'm Minister of Tourism, I can promote Siwa. Siwa is one of the most fantastic places in the world. <laughs> um, uh, and Where is it? It's, uh, it's uh, in the desert. Yes. Um, <laughs> and uh, if you go to the northern coast from Marsa Matruh, uh -huh. uh, it's an oasis. Right. And again, I don't know how much time we have, but um, there's a place in Siwa. Yeah. If you make a wish, it comes true. All right. Okay, <laughs> I guarantee it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, I was I, I did my New Year's <coughs> Eve in Siwa, and then went to Jordan mm -hmm. to uh, to uh, to lead this mission on monetary policy and financial stability. And from Siwa, you take uh, uh, sa uh, salt, yeah. and it's uh, for detoxing. So mm -hmm. you know, I I, I, I I take a very nice uh, bath on that Wednesday night. That was the tenth. Uh, of January and sleep at 9 p.m. Wake up in the morning and I have 700 missed calls on my phone. Of course, the first thing that comes to my mind, I call my mom in the US, are you okay? Yes, what's wrong? She's like, call your dad. I called my dad, are you okay? This was 5 a.m. Cairo time. And he says, yeah, where have you been? I was sleeping. I said, Rania, call this person. Egypt is looking for you. I was like, so anyway, I call this person. It's like, uh, we want you to come to be sworn in. And I said, uh, <laughs> uh, sworn in for what? And he says, Minister of Tourism. I said, guys, you, you know my career. <laughs> you know, banking, <laughs> central banking, international yes. institutions, economics, uh, finance, tourism. He said, yes, uh, the president thinks that uh, this sector uh, needs to be run uh, from an economic perspective. Interesting. And this sector represents 20% of Egypt's GDP. Uh, globally, uh, tourism represents 10% of global GDP. One in every 10 jobs globally is in tourism. 30% mm -hmm. of uh, exports and services comes from the tourism sector. So uh, this was- in uh, Egypt uh, as well. Uh, globally. globally. This is right. globally. So the impact of this sector uh, on a global scale mm -hmm. is a very big one. And uh, it's a service sector. And given uh, everything that we're seeing today, uh, with respect to uh, uh, services, the way mm -hmm. they're being changed, the way digitalization is making mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. everyone from their home being able to provide a service. It's just a, a, a very impactful yes. uh, uh, position to be in. So this was on that Thursday, they gave me that call. They changed my flight 
from our men Washington on Friday morning to our men Cairo on Friday morning. I was sworn in on Sunday. And 10 days later, I had to go to the US and do my settlement and ship my stuff. And I didn't even have clothes to be sworn in. It was just a nightmare. So all my life, when you say infliction points, I have like plenty that's, that's of anecdotes. That's quite an infliction point. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's, uh, I took over the sector. Um, and uh, um, when I look back at this year and, and three months or four months, um, uh, I, feel, uh, I feel very proud uh, um, to be able to uh, impact individuals, yeah. uh, to be able to uh, use skills yeah. that you've learned um, uh, in, in, in driving policy, in designing policy, mm. uh, in creating uh, buy-in from different stakeholders. Yeah. Uh, I think all of this, uh, even though it's not uh, your uh, discipline, yeah. but the skills that you gain uh, definitely uh, equip you can you to be able to apply Can you that. tell us a little bit more about that? I mean, an economist, uh, doctor, and uh, strategist uh, background, uh, you're a strategist, definitely. So how, uh, what's your vision for tourism in Egypt? Uh, it's a large portion of the economy. Uh, everybody here has visited Egypt, I hope, right? Yeah. Okay, so we all have, at least more than once. and. Uh, it's it's actually a dream for every person in the world to to go and see the Egypt yes. and the pyramids. So, what's your vision, practically speaking? So, um, uh, when I took uh, when I took over, I felt that uh, the way uh, the sector was handled uh, traditionally uh, was from a very piecemeal approach. So, something happens and we try and go and fix it. Uh, an issue here, we try and contain it. Yeah. Um, I wanted to. Um, apply uh, newer concepts. I mm. wanted to change the narrative mm -hmm. on the sector. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, something very mm. significant about uh, In this. In what way you yeah. say change the narrative? Change the narrative. I wanted to, uh, to show that we are applying modern thinking mm -hmm. when we think of such an important and vital sector for the country. Mm. So I put together uh, the e-trip E-TRIP is short for Egypt Tourism Reform Program. Right. And it's a uh, structural reform program that mm. addresses uh, different pillars required to put the sector on a sustainable path. Mm -hmm. So legislative reform, institutional reform, uh, new ways of promoting uh, and marketing the mm. country, mm. Uh, investment uh, mm. and infrastructure, mm. and international trends. Mm. So for example, having uh, the, sustain the sustainable development goals as the heart of what we uh, apply, having an overarching objective, mm. which is not counting number of tourists, but mm. making sure that every Egyptian household has at least one person working in tourism. Wow. That is a goal that um, uh, I believe uh, uh, we can achieve. And it's a way to mobilize everyone around this sector. Mm -hmm. Our promotion campaign, for example, just to give an idea, uh, has three key uh, elements. Uh, the first one is, when I, you talk about the narrat uh, mm. mentioning the narrative, is P2P, people to people. We want to show uh, Egyptian people are people of pride, peace, positivity, oh. progress, productivity. Uh, it's the power of P, people above politics. And um, um, the idea is, when you're talking about travelers today, and all of us travel, and mm. we like to engage with communities. So it's people and places. And uh, we are very blessed to have so many destinations in our yes. country. And every destination yeah. has its uh, food, uh, its handicrafts, uh, yeah. its uh, clothes, the traditions. So uh, we want to showcase the yeah. people in different places. We also want to showcase contemporary Egyptians, the perception that people have sometimes, uh, women uh, may be staying at home, not educated, etc. Uh, we have women who are in sports, mm -hmm. we have women who are uh, in, uh, in painting, I mean in, in arts, in music. Um, uh, we have very skilled uh, uh, actors and actresses and so on. So it's, it's showing the contemporary uh, face of Egypt. So that's the P2P campaign. Then we have the Grand Egyptian Museum, the GEM. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's going to open in the fourth quarter of 2020. 
And, uh, in 60 seconds, what is the Grand Museum? The Grand Egyptian it's Museum is, going, is, a, is a museum, uh, a $1 billion uh, museum. It's uh, on the plateau of Giza. Yeah. And it is going to be the only museum in the world dedicated to one civilization. Mm -hmm. So all the pieces in the museum are uh, from uh, Pharaonic uh, Egypt, mm -hmm. and it will have the full collection of Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun is the most famous pharaoh globally. Yeah. And uh, 5,000 pieces of his collection are in the museum. And even though you have Egyptian artifacts in different places in the world, yeah. this is the only museum that has the pyramids as its backdrop. So you can take a selfie with oh, Tutankhamun and the pyramids at the same time. So the, you, very we, tough we to beat. We can do that. <laughs> <laughs> very, very tough to beat. The other thing that this museum holds, and, and when you know, it's just so uh, breathtaking, you just pass by it. Uh -huh. uh, it has all these ancient monuments inside, mm -hmm. but the facade is very contemporary. Mm -hmm. And this is the story you want to tell. When we say the narrative, Fantastic. you have the history, but also you have the contemporary and phase of the country. And it's meant to open in 2020? The fourth quarter of 2020. Great date. Yes. Great. So this is fantastic. Uh, but practically speaking, and real life is that we have challenges. And when it comes to Egypt and tourism, uh, you know, everyone thinks, um, you know, the instability, the security, etc. These are challenges. What's? How do you deal with this? How do you address issues like that? Yes, um, uh, we have uh, been through different uh, episodes, and I think uh, uh, lately. Uh, the government has invested so much in the infrastructure related to security mm -hmm. and uh, our numbers are back up and people have been voting with their feet. Right. And uh, also internationally uh, for the uh, steps that the government has taken with respect to security, with respect to the reform program, with respect to changing this narrative, we have awar been awarded several uh, uh, prizes lately. Mm -hmm. So we from the World uh, Tourism and Travel Council, Egypt mm -hmm. received the Champion Award for Resilience in Tourism, particularly for the topic yes. you mentioned. Yes. Um, and uh, uh, again, the, the, the idea that uh, people come, have a good time, mm -hmm. uh, write about this, mm -hmm. uh, reflect it, encourages others to come as well. So uh, the government uh, uh, mindfully puts all its resources mm -hmm. to ensure that everyone has uh, a safe and secure trip. Fantastic. So, uh, you know, we were at the World Economic Forum in Jordan, and um, I was really looking forward to your session, which was entitled uh, Tech in Tourism. Okay, and uh, we're, you know, uh, we're, we know a little bit about tech, so really we want to hear your point of view on how tech can transform, accelerate uh, uh, tourism, shape the tourism industry in, in a country as important as you. So, um, um, in, in our reform program, the, f the final pillar is called International uh, Trends. Yeah. And in there, there are three areas, green tourism, women empowerment, and digitalization. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I remember the days when I would be traveling in the US, and we would have to go to AAA to get the maps, <laughs> and open up the map, and you know, have, you know, use our pin, and then you know, yeah. have these uh, markers, yeah. and so forth. Today, you want to travel on your phone, uh, you choose the location, you choose the restaurant, uh, you, uh, you have a translation of this, you have a translation. So really, um, um, and that's why I started by saying tourism is a, is a services sector. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, everything that is, the, the ease by which uh, automation has helped um, uh, services be delivered to customers in an easy and, and, and more, uh, 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 accessible way uh, means uh, that uh, if you are not joining this fourth yeah. industrial revolution as yeah. it's called or this uh, innovative move when it comes to an important sector such as tourism yeah. you're going to be left left yeah. out so everyone makes their decisions where to eat where to travel how to travel who to meet who's in a certain place all through the devices that companies like yourself uh, very skillfully uh, make uh, 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 available and make accessible to all of us uh, as customers. Yeah. So um, the other thing is uh, when I, I to say- to be useful, as yeah. you say. <laughs> so um, uh, when I say that our overarching objective uh, is to have uh, at least one individual in every household in Egypt working in this sector, this can be possible 
uh, by people um, uh, you know, contributing one way or another uh, by providing services in an automated, in a digital way. So this is, this is a, uh, a very important uh, scope uh, where you ease uh, the experience of a visitor and at the same time you are able uh, to get uh, many and more people involved in providing that service in different ways. Fantastic. We, we will uh, watch this uh, space very carefully and hope to learn together on, on, on how this is going to transform the tourism industry in Egypt. Uh, there are a lot of questions and we really need to uh, sort of... Uh, 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 I have a question to ask and everybody's... Uh, you know, what's your favorite site in Egypt? Well, um, I, to be politically correct, <laughs> Every place in Egypt is. <laughs> we know about Siwa. <laughs> yeah. We just discovered Siwa. Yeah, yeah. Siwa is, uh, is very special yeah. um, uh, because I don't know if people know about this, but Alexander the Great, yeah. uh, in one of his expeditions, yeah. passed by Siwa. Uh -huh. And he asked the priests in the temple there, the it's oracle. called the Temple of the Oracle, um, I want you to go and ask if I'm the son of Amun. Yeah. So the priests go into the temple. There's a sacred chamber there, and they go, and of course they talk to the god Amun, and they come out with the verdict, which is, yes, of course, you're the son <laughs> of Amun. <laughs> so <laughs> Alexander the Great discovered <laughs> that he was the son of Amun um, in, in Siwa. No, it's, uh, every place in Egypt is extremely special. I don't say this mm. because I'm the yeah. minister, but um, uh, even the seas. I mean, you, you have the Mediterranean, sure. you have the Red Sea, and in the Red Sea, you have Diving. different places. Yeah. Not yeah. Yeah. Sharm el Sheikh, Hergada, Marsa Alam, Sahel yeah. Hashish. Yeah. It just keeps going on and on and on. Dahab. If you are a backpacker, you can have fun. If you want to be on a cruise, you can have fun. If you want to spend a lot of money, you can have fun. If you're on a budget, you can have fun. So it's uh, you have the history, you have the beach, you have the you know many many areas uh, are known for only one type of product. In Egypt, you can combine different things. The Grand Egyptian Museum uh, is going to have uh, Sphinx Airport. 30 minutes away from it, so mm -hmm. you can see the museum and then go to Sharm el-Sheikh for, you know, continue your leisure and sun and beach yeah. holiday. So I, uh, uh, I think that uh, everyone in the world, being a kid, is fascinated by the pyramids and wants to come and, mm -hmm. and take, um, um, yeah. you know, a picture with, with a monument. Uh, there's so much that can happen, and, and the first people to use Instagram were the pharaohs. Every wall. How is that? They have so many stories. <laughs> 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 They've posted all their stories already. So uh, it's uh, the more you, uh, the more you, you learn, and the more you see. And I, of course, now that I'm a minister, I get to to spend more times at temples. Um, uh, the genius behind uh, this civilization um, is a testament not just to the Egyptians but to all of humanity. Yeah. Uh, the genius of humanity is really something that needs to be celebrated, um, and you can celebrate it in Egypt anywhere. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Vanya. We open the floor for questions. Uh, please state your name and your uh, sort of what you do at Google. I, I had the Pierre. Sure. Hi, my name is Pierre. I'm part of the club team. Uh, wait, wait. <laughs> oh, we, oh, right. So, so this is the mic? Uh, no, this is the mic. This is the mic. <laughs> Hello, my name is Pierre. <laughs> so um, as part of your path, you joined uh, networks like Young Global Leaders. How has this type of network mm -hmm. and focus groups helped you in your four C's? And now, do you still feel that if, if you have not joined, would you have had the same trajectory? Yeah. No, thank you for that question. Um, uh, of course, Young Global Leaders, uh, this is with the World Economic Forum. This is a, a fascinating network. And, um, uh, you know, no one can do it on their own. Um, to succeed, you need the people around you uh, to celebrate with you, to, uh, to compete with you, uh, to help you grow. Um, networks like this uh, provide you with a very robust support system. Uh, if I have personal problems, I call. If I am in a country, uh, in a city, and I want to reach out and have dinner with a friend, I call. If there's a conference I want to attend and I can't get in, that's the connection that will get you in. So mm -hmm. these networks are extremely, extremely, extremely important. I remember I did uh, a leadership course at Harvard with my YGL group. And uh, it's a very interesting uh, concept. There, 
they split us up into LDGs. LDGs are leadership development groups. And um, they put five people from the network together and we sign confidentiality agreements because it's really like a psychological group. We basically pour out all our problems and emotions and so forth. So you have the CEO of this company and you're, everybody's really successful. And at the end of the day, you discover that everyone is very vulnerable. Everyone has a weak point. So as much strength uh, as you need to succeed and go forward and so forth, uh, it's normal to have pitfalls. It's normal to feel vulnerable. It's normal uh, to need support from different groups. So it's, it's uh, I mean, at the end of the day, human interactions are what last. Your title is going to go away. You might lose a job today. Stay for a while before you get your next job. But really what matters at the end of the day is the human interaction. And that's why in a workplace, uh, um, or whether you're a boss, you're a colleague, you're a subordinate, the human interaction is what lasts. So always invest in it. So definitely YGL groups are extremely, I mean, it's a fantastic network, has served me tremendously. Um, there are other networks that I'm part of. And uh, always look out to becoming a mentor. Always look out to be mentored. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot to be gained on both sides. Great. Hi. Is over there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Farid. I'm a customer engineer on the cloud team. Uh, to go back to your roots, I guess, to economics a little bit. Uh, amongst the general public, there's a lot of uh, ambiguity and lack of clarity about how our financial and especially our banking systems work, things like fractional reserves and debt, debt creation. Um, do you think that is just a result of lack of curiosity or is it by design? And the second part of the question, fast forward 50, 100 years, do you think we will have moved to a radically different system? Something Economically. better, yeah. Economically. yeah. Um, you know, when you look back at the global financial crisis in 2008, why did it happen? It happened because the regulator was lower than the market when it came to innovative uh, instruments that were made available. Mortgage-backed securities, uh, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so, uh, the, given the technology, given the innovation, definitely the speed by which uh, markets are uh, internalizing uh, all this innovation is much faster sometimes than the regulator, regardless of where the regulator is. The regulator could be the IMF, the regulator could be a government, the regulator could be a central bank, the regulator could be in the US, could be in the UK, could be in a developing country, doesn't matter. But um, um, the speed by which things are moving are definitely faster than the way regulation is keeping up. And so by design, uh, there is going to be um, um, some sort of wedge. Uh, and the idea is how do we minimize the damage from that wedge? So all the regulations that are happening today and everything that is uh, being thought of and all the discussions and the panels is how do you really try and, and, and close that gap between the, the pace of innovation and the way that you regulate that innovation? Um, you know, a few years ago, who would have thought Brexit would happen and the implications and the fallout from that? Um, so there is, there is definitely a change in uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, so much going on. And, uh, and the idea is um, regulators have to be open to include ideas and to include, um, and you, you take a look at the uh, uh, IFIs today, international financial institutions, uh, for example, at the World Bank and the IMF annual meetings, there's always someone from FinTech, there's always someone uh, uh, from the atypical uh, institution sitting on a panel because the regulator needs to understand how the systems are evolving. They're evolving at a very fast pace. So absolutely, uh, 2050, I don't know where we'll be, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, I hope it's a better world. Great. Uh, last question, though. Okay, where is the camera? Okay, <laughs> Victor. Hi, uh, Dr. Anya. So I'm a proud AUCN too. You reminded me of uh, Computer Science 106. I remember that class. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you mentioned something critical about people in tourism, people being the core, right? And uh, if you go to like Sinai, it's amazing how experience sometimes trumps education. You, you see hotel workers speaking Italian. In Hergada, they speak German. And I'm wondering, you know, you're mentioning that in every family you want to have uh, someone in the uh, tourism sector. So how are we enabling, how are we empowering these people to be 
and I'm not talking about Murshidin, right? I'm talking sure. about the the larger yeah. um, tourism industry. So what are we doing uh, in that regard? And do you see a role in tech, for example, in helping with that? Yeah. You know, it's, um, uh, it, it's very uh, 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 unintuitive that Egypt, with all its riches, and I was just telling this to colleagues, I have never engaged in a lunch or dinner conversation with my parents, with my relatives, with my friends, and anyone telling anyone, get a job in tourism. Be a restaurant owner, be an Egyptologist, be a guide, uh, go and open up a hotel. It never happens. I have never, ever, in my different circles, my friends, my cousins, nobody has this on mind. And this is very strange, right? It comes as a no-brainer. We have all these beaches and all this history. Why don't we capitalize and leverage and actually uh, get people interested and trained and dreaming of you know, being part uh, uh, of this sector? So we're doing many things. Uh, um, through the reform program, when you take a look at it, uh, in schools, uh, we're going to start competitions on ethics of tourism, and we're going to try and see how we can bring role models, uh, hotel owners, company owners, restaurant owners, uh, startups who work in the sector, how can they become advocates of more people wanting to work in the sector? Because unfortunately, the perception is always you're going to be a concierge in a, re in a, in a hotel, you're going to be a waiter. Uh, the idea that it's an export, you're going to be an exporter. You can be a businessman or a businesswoman. You can be an entrepreneur. You can create an application. You can sell that application for a lot of money and be a millionaire, you know? So there's so much that um, is not uh, internalized yeah. because it's not advertised. Um, I think that's, and that's when I say we're changing the narrative yeah. on tourism. I think that's, that was the key. Uh, when I do interviews and I post it on Instagram or Twitter, the feedback I get mm -hmm. from people who, l Egyptians living all over the world, who say, we want to come and work with you, we want to be yeah. on your team, we want to participate, what can we do? I want to do this for free. It's just creating that whole uh, uh, interest and hype uh, about it, and then try and channel through different partnerships, how we can utilize uh, what has been successful in other countries and apply it. We have a very vibrant youth. We have a very um, uh, engaging youth, uh, people who are extremely smart, but they want the opportunities. And I think through tourism, you yeah, you, you, through tourism, there's so much you can contribute to that there can be an opportunity for everyone who's interested uh, and who's serious. Changing the mindset is, is critical uh, with respect to yeah. the youth in, in Egypt for, for tourism. Uh, by the way, my personal favorite, it should be on everyone's bucket list, is the Nile Cruise. Who has done the Nile Cruise here? Why, why the rest haven't done it yet? <laughs> you have to do it. <laughs> That's, uh, it's, it's absolutely uh, wonderful. Uh, Dr. Rania, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having uh, me. And um, it's, it's really been uh, uh, inspirational, and thank you for, for taking. I know you were attending a conference. You, you came here especially uh, to have these meetings and interaction. This is, this is wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you.